What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the weekly recap edition of the Daily Energy News Speed Stand Up here on this gorgeous January 27th, 2024. As always, humble correspondent Michael Tanner joined by Stuart Turley. Awesome week. Lots of great stories. Oh, unbelievable. And then on uh, Sunday, we'll be releasing Carolina Ortega from um, uh, Milestone. She is talking about scope three emissions and how to even track scope one and scope two with some pretty cool solutions interesting well i'm not trying to track my scope three emissions so no um, i just have to use scope when i brush my teeth otherwise you know it's just hope. it's better than a lot of jokes you could have said so we appreciate that guys <laughs> Really appreciate you hanging with us, especially here on this weekend. Um, check us out again, www.energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis you hear come from there, dashboardenergynewsbeat.com. Everything you need to know is in the link below. Otherwise, I'm turning it over to the weekly recap. We'll see you Monday, folks. All right. Hey, let's start off with our first article here, dude. Uh, 2023, the year the renewables bubble burst. Michael, it's been, I've never seen this much animosity towards renewables uh, Mm -hmm. coming up. I mean, and A, renewables are not sustainable, but let's go ahead and take a look at this article. It's pretty crazy. Why did energy, clean energy, take the biggest hit? Uh, Wind and solar are more exposed to cost of capital and interest rates. Oh. Well, first off, why is that? Is you got to take out debt to use it. Oh, yeah. Oops. And cash flow. Oops. And here's the other thing. Are characterized up front by capital expenditure with low operating costs. Hogwash. This one I disagree with. Solar PV cost jumped up 23% from 2022 to 2023. Wow. There was also a slowdown in the secondary market. Um, a 71% drop in transactions between investors and developers. Part of this was due to the horrific backlog of regulatory problems. What's interesting is I think let's, let's stick on this secondary market. Why is this important? Why is the secondary market important? Well, because the secondary market is where people like, I mean, not me and you, Stu, but businesses who aren't necessarily in the development space can now have an opportunity to invest. Basically, let's say, Stu, you and I have a company. Me and you you sell shares directly to one of our friends, family, or fools. Okay? They give us some money. If they're friends with us, they are fools. They are fools. Okay? Right. Then they have a stock certificate. Right. Quote, unquote. A secondary transaction is them taking the fools taking that sec that stock uh uh for or you know stock certificate and selling it to somebody else. That's called the secondary market, which is what is that? That's the free market valuing that stock certificate. Think about yep. it. Me and you convince somebody to give us a hundred grand, we give them ten thousand shares. That's us really selling them. It's, it's why we joke right. the friends, family, and fools round when you raise money. Um, who, who invests in small businesses? Friends, family, fools. But the secondary market is much more indicative of what I would call the free market optimization of finding an optimal price for something, aka pricing securities correctly. Primary markets, there can be arbitrage opportunity. So when you see secondary markets collapse, what does that mean? There's no market for anything. The original primary transaction was so overpriced that now there's not even a secondary market for people right. like, you know, for example, who uh, uh, the Carolina Panthers uh, owner, David Tepper, where did right. he make all his money? Junk bonds. What are junk bonds? Secondary market transactions, buying up debt of certain companies that was issued to other that was issued by banks and are now being traded on the open market. Those guys see arbitrage opportunities to come in and purchase. There's none of that going on here. I right. th- I, I I don't mean to harp on it, but I thought this was the most interesting part uh, and, and analysis in uh, this article. I love what you're saying because I missed right over that. I mean, I just it went right over both of my ears. Uh, great job. Uh, did you just get another score on the game? No, I was just signifying that. Oh, oh, 
yeah, yeah, put well, right over your head. Yeah. You can't even it. Okay, let's go to the next part. Well, here. no, I think it's important because they also talk about what's on the horizon for 2024 in this article. That was where I was going. And when you talk about this, uh, through although the investment sediment has changed and fossil fuels in the meantime have become somewhat fashionable again as energy security has been reprioritized, the energy transition and investment into clean energy has not slowed down. I disagree. It's about to take a hammer in the back of the head. U.S. $1.7 trillion was invested into clean energy in 2023, 65% more than into fossil fuels. Um, uh, Wood McKenzie expects 710 gigawatts uh, of new wind and solar capacity to be built across Europe by 2030. I disagree with that totally. I think that as we come back around into this, people are done and they have got to get some more affordable um, uh, energy. Here's my prediction, Michael. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen and energy storage. I believe that hydrogen is going to be the next big carbon capture and hydrogen is going to push um, uh, solar and wind off on the side. Solar and wind are now being documented. Everybody's running away from it. Everybody's going to be running to hydrogen, even though I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. But carbon capture and carbon taxes is where wealth distribution is going to be big in 2024. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it's clear the renewables, the and but. I think what's, what I like about this article is it shows specifically why the renewables bubble burst. What happened in 2023? The Fed stopped 0% interest rates. The era of ZERP, no more. <laughs> Much like the Airbnb. The- no zero and no zero dollar for you. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, I, I can tell you firsthand examples of people who I know in the real estate business who had a strategy that was based upon 0% interest rates. Well, when you can't go out and refinance your property, whether you're a real estate investor or whether you're a huge capital developer, well, guess what? You're you're in big trouble. It's it's an interesting reason. One of the reasons why the the the, the shale boom and bust was so different was because sure there was a, a decent amount of debt that was lost because there was a bunch of debt raised money uh, drilled into these unproductive wells, but there's a lot of equity. There was a lot more destroyed in the oil and gas business we're in the renewables business it's all debt there's no real equity being put into this because it's so easy to get financing for renewable energies every bank wants to go out and finance an offshore wind farm or right. you now offshore wind is probably holding up the best comparative to on onshore solar and onshore wind those two have taken a huge hit in terms of uh um uh equity or excuse me debt implosion so it really the, the story for renewables that is that the, it's not the technology necessarily that's failing. It is, but really what's happening is the financing behind it has collapsed because it's not profitable. Right. And plus uh, there's about 19 other things on there, but Egypt's gas and LNG global challenges and global ambitions. This is over at uh, the folks over there at R, uh, RBAC. They are fabulous. We've got Dr. Uh, Robert Brooks and Cyrus Brooks. Have I've had the pleasure of interviewing both of them, and they are phenomenal. They are a natural gas uh, commodities firm that they have around the world. Uh, market fundamental analysis tool. You got to go see, check them out. Um, Egypt has uh, 62% of their grid is supported by natural gas. And uh, Miss Producer, if you could fly in uh, Israeli gas fields, this is the Leviathan field. And you take a look at Cyprus, you take a look at uh, Israel and Egypt, those pipelines coming over uh, are uh, the proposed existing LNG plant and then the existing LNG plant, and then the uh, optional new pipelines. Right now, from the Leviathan field, they have to go to Israel and then over to 
uh, Egypt, and it would sure make a lot more sense just to go straight over. So if it does uh, happen, it would make sense. Now, for local consumption, if you take a look at, um, they have plans to assist in the development on the offshore Gaza marine field approved by an Israel. Uh, and if it would, it would help Gaza achieve energy independence as well. There's a lot going on in this article and we need to go ahead and follow up back uh, with um, RBAC and really help uh, go through this and more. However, taking a look at LNG uh, exports, this could actually be a big player there. The Davos consensus is finally cracking. This is a funny story. When we take a look about the fallout of Davos, there's several different mm -hmm. things. I think that we're seeing in a society that uh, Davos is really kind of con concerned that the, their narrative has been broken. One of the leaders has said, we've lost the media. No, you didn't lose the media. The media, the people left the media, the wide mainstream media, people are tired of it. So you took it to the too far to the next level in order to go ahead and say, wait a minute, this is the way we're going to go. People are now tired of that. Uh, it also took $40 billion in Elon to go ahead and give everybody their own voice and people are not watching TV. They're not watching uh, um, streaming services. They're watching podcasts. Um, and so the bulk reports uh, percolating out of the WEF uh, have been scornful, revealing a pro, uh, proposed program of enlightened elite global governance is not going quite as planned. That's a great way to say it. Um, Stephen Schwartzman, CEO of the financial services Blackstone, mused that he didn't think the United States were prepared for further deficits and open borders. They are also believing that Trump is going to be the Republican nominee and stands a really, really good chance of being elected. It's not whether or not you're a Democrat or you're Republican. The Americans want American first. I don't really care if you're Republican or if you're a Democrat. I am a Christian male and I am wanting absolutely America and our children first. If you're a Democrat and you're a Republican and you don't have God, country, children first, I really don't really care about you anymore. And that is the way the rest of the United States is coming along. So uh, when we take a look at Davos, this is a really good article on uh, what's coming around the corner. $2 billion in subsidies and only two EV station to open. Holy smokes, Batman, Michael. You know, I still can't believe all these years ago, you and I were going, hey, man, that's a couple million dollar deal. That's a big deal. And then we went to, hey, what's a few billion between friends? Now we can't even get a charger installed it's for insane. a couple billion. This, uh, this is unbelievable. Uh, the government rollout of EV chargers has been a slow motion affair. And uh, $7.5 in funding from the 2021 infrastructure porculus bill Transportation uh, Secretary Pete Buttigieg said, we have a chance to lead the world in the EV revolution. <laughs> Let's go through some of the numbers. Light V, uh, half the money will be spent where no one can be afforded. Uh, let's see, EV sales, um, 1.1 million, actually 1.2. Uh, they the number down here. There's 1.7 million EVs in the total U.S. out of 292 million vehicles. That's a percentage rate of 0.58%. <laughs> wow. Gee, yikes. 
Yeah. Uh, only 6% in the U.S. want EV for their next vehicle. It's not going to happen. That's, I, I mean, what's hilarious. It just goes to show you, anytime the government is investing, there will be overruns. But two billion for an EV station. Oh, yeah, I got a hammer. Uh, this is a two dollar, two billion dollar pin right here, right now, uh, and it's the insurance that is absolutely going nuts. It goes, what about repairs? What about insurance? Uh, we started the insurance thing uh, several months ago, and the, it started really going nuts in um, uh, Europe. Uh, but how fast is eventually? I love that quote. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Uh, I think I know a good guy that knows some things about mines. I believe there's a school in Colorado. Oh, yeah. Colorado School of Mines. Pay attention to copper before it derails the energy transition. I don't think there's going to be a transition. Uh, it's going to take a revolution. But the problem is that copper is going to be needed for just electrification of everything there is a huge the ceo of glencore gary nagel has warned about an impending massive copper deficit 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 mm -hmm. boy that's a uh, oklahoma way to talk and stress that the world is not fully prepared for it um the Blanca II expansion in Chile uh, experienced significant cost overruns and construction delays. We're not going to have it. Uh, construction, you have uh, uh, South America is not going to be the resources where we, we're going to need it. You're well, just. The, the problem is this and this is why i think it's important for somebody to, to hear this from somebody like gary nagel i mean i'm no fan of glencore they're probably one of the more corrupt um large traders in the world you know they're a physical commodities trader and you, know, you right. guys just go look up how much they've paid in fines i think you can we can all look we can all google glencore fines you know they used to you know they used to be you know phil and rich you know a uh, uh, rich and co and you know we all know what happened there but my point is these guys do have their pulse on the physical commodities market and how they their one their uh, orders were stolen all their copper that was an interest. That's a different. That's that's a story we covered a few months ago. But yes. So okay. what 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 things like Glencore, Trafigura, um, right. Avitol, they're physical commodities traders. So what do they do? They take the commodity from somewhere and they bring it somewhere else. Well, what companies like Glencore have now gone out and done is they've gone out and bought the source production. Glencore is really big in the minerals and mining space. Trafigure is a little bit bigger um, when it comes to oil. So along with VTOL, Glencore also does a lot of coal. So they know. But what he's saying is, even if we wanted more coal, more copper, we can't get it because these projects can't get approved. All of the projects that we're currently investing in, High overruns, meaning they're never net. They're, they're they won't necessarily pay out, which means you're never going to get financing. You know, and you know, with on a six and a half on a six. You know, this recent study, Sesco, they found that these large scale projects delayed by an average of four point three to six point three years. That's on top of a seven year production cycle. So you're talking over a over. I mean, it's incredible how long these things. It's a decade and a half to get something like this done. And yet we think we're just going to increase the amount of copper supply by three times to, I mean, you want to talk about getting me worked up. <laughs> I kind of threw that in there intentionally. Let's see, let's see school of mines got his masters. I mean, it's got nothing to do with that. More so that yeah, people are you un. Don't like, you don't like incompetent boobs trying to make an energy transition using copper when they can't even do it right. No, I'm all for I'm all for using copper. I think we just have to be very clear specifically about, OK, if we're going to move into a post fossil fuel world, what does that actually look like? You know, I, I, we were on a call with a client today, Stu, and it cracked me up because you get to sell the dream. You're the politician. You know, right. I actually have to live in reality and make <laughs> things happen. 
So that's where my focus is. It, it was one of the fun because it's true. You know, there are people that are allowed to sell the dream, <laughs> sell the dream of renewals. I'm all for the dream. But now we have to come back and live in reality and figure out, okay, what can we actually do today? And then what are the ste- the actual steps, one foot in front of another, they're going to get us to the end. You're the old uh, boots on the ground kind of guy. Yes, I'm the I am the boots on the ground. I am I am infantry. <laughs> Attack that hill. Here, this one's a really, really cool one. It's a really short one from our buddy over there, Steve Reese. Uh, for natural gas, it's buckle up and hang on for 2024. Uh, over at Reese Consulting, uh, they have absolutely um uh measure they know natural gas he is an industry thought leader and michael i have to give him a shout out he looked at one of my podcasts and put a comment on linkedin steve reese i can't wait to hug you at nape for this comment he goes Stu, you're sporting one heck of a dome hat <laughs> <laughs> For 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 our podcast listeners, I got a little bit of a flesh hairline. <laughs> it's really shiny. It's really I I don't waste much in my hair cutting anymore. But let me go through some of these. If market forecasts are correct, this is a quote from Steve. Natural gas producers will take it on a chin in 2024 before the heavens part and gears start turning at new LNG export terminals, adding capacity in 2025. So Steve is taking into consideration some of the issues the Biden administration is working on this. And that regulatory thread that we were talking about is going to be a widespread impact. Listen to this quote. In an ironic twist to a milder uh, winter, a week-long freeze this month triggered the cancellation of five LNG uh, cargoes to sell from Louisiana and Texas. Chenier Energy requires a 40-day notice for cancellations. Gas storage is up to its eyeballs. <laughs> I love Steve. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I, we love Steve Reese. He's he he's one of the smartest people and most informed people when it comes yes. to the midstream business because it's what he's done for forty years. Oh, and uh, he he calls it like he sees it, and yep. he is a trusted resource to CEOs all around the world. I think the only other thing I saw in the oil oil space too that i thought was was hilarious was uh diversified energy they're one of the largest owners uh, <laughs> of u.s oil and natural gas wells they're being targeted by a short seller claiming that the company may not have enough money to meet its obligations to plug inactive wells this one you can find enter diversified energy faces short seller attack from esg focused snowcap what's interesting is this snowcap research they're a london-based aquas uh, activist investor who focuses specifically on esg government matters went ahead and released a 39 page report and i mean I will, we'll have the report on the website too it's absolutely brutal what it breaks down so to give Ooh. you guys an idea let's introduce diversifies energy's business model and now this is you know straight up off their website so they go ahead and acquire Mature, low productive oil and gas wells. They're the largest oil and gas or owner of oil and gas wells in the country, more than Exxon, more than Chevron, more Whoa. than everybody. What right. they do is they don't drill new wells. They claim to extend the life of operating lives via, quote, smarter asset management. Hmm. Next, they delay well retirement and associated plugging costs by pushing out those costs as much as 50 years. Again, they do not engage new drilling or exploration and instead must replenish any declining production with new acquisitions, and they securitize wells with amortizing debt to support higher leverage. All that means, no cap research says, these guys suck. So give you just to give you an idea what they're claiming, Uh, what they're claiming is a few things. They're claiming that their self-reported discretionary cash flows they're being used... Basically, they're using not what what they claim is this. I'll I'll pull up the slide here. I want to make sure I sell this right because we're about to body these people. Um, wow. Where is it here? I, it blah, just blah, blah. dawned it, when you said that. It dawned on me. 
what was going on. That is a, that's worse than a Ponzi yep. scheme. So to give, to give you guys an idea, when they are calculating, so one of the chief things that they claim, Snowcap says, is that, oh, the dividend that they're giving out, their $150 million a year of dividends is nowhere near what they're going to be. They're not going to nearly be able to sustain that because their methodology for calculating um, dividends was based off adjusted EBITDA, a non-GAAP number yeah. based instead right. of basing it upon cash from operations and adds back new debt issued for acquisitions despite excluding debt repayments in li- in line with its declining EBITDA. That also means that instead, it basically, it, they calculate, all that being said, if you recalculate discretionary class flows based in 2022, it's a 73% difference and not in a good way. Folks, diversified energy... If you have any investment in them, I don't give investment advice, but I'd seriously look into getting rid of them. Absolutely incredible 39-page story. I mean, Stu didn't even read the report. He sees what's going on right now. You just read the thing, and it just dawned on me. This is not good. No, it's absolutely not. Shares are down as much as 20%. um, We're down as much as 20% in the day. Um, but they only are down 3%. You know, in, di- in di- Diversify's defense, they did come out and say, report contains numerous inac- inaccuracies, ignores financial and operational results, and sustainability action is designed for the sole purpose of negatively impacting the share price for the short seller's benefit. Um, I mean, 65,000 oil and gas wells is, it's a lot. It's more than everybody. And they're based out of Birmingham, Alabama. Bama. They don't drill wells, which is just crazy. Um, no, uh, you know, that goes back to what we talked to, to our clients about oil and gas, not all oil and gas investments are the same and do your homework. I love that. You're just like, Nope, Nope. I'm good. <laughs> Cause you know what? I'm the same way, Stu. Nope. I'm good. Yeah. I'm just like, Holy smokes. Um, that's just unethical. It's extremely unethical. Wow. It's extremely unethical. Oh. So absolutely unbelievable, Stu. Um, we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> <laughs>